What's up my rapscallious red mombins? This is Rob from the Gay Guy Plays and today on Hashtag Confirmed we're gonna be digging into DevStream 135 via a dev workshop? Basically what DE did in their latest dev stream is they took this article and went point by point and basically read you shit that you didn't want to read yourself. What a novel idea! So what we're going to be doing today is instead of taking a dev's perspective on this, I'm going to go ahead and give you a player's perspective on the different points that they put out. In addition, I'm going to trim the fat because there are some things that really just don't need to be deeply explained. Some of them are just common sense. In addition to that, I will toss up any clips on screen that I feel are necessary um, because they did show off some gameplay that might help you understand things a little bit better. So without ado, let's go ahead and jump on in. So our overlord, D.E. Rebecca, posts 2020's first mainline review, revise, refresh, my rapscallious red mombin. See, I went for the alliteration there. Now, Operation Scarlet Spear is coming this March, and it's bringing a massive lore event that introduces Squad Link, now known as Operation Link. Scarlet Spear will move the stakes of the world forward in a new cinematic. Prepare yourselves, Tenno. The sentient threat is deploying forces that the Origin system has not seen since the Old War. It will be the first of Warframe's many content expansions this year, but before we dive into the new Scarlet Spear's launch, we're bringing some of the biggest revisions to Warframe to date. In this extremely long workshop, we are covering a broad variety of topics that are all receiving focused overhauls or quality of life improvements. We are originally going to ship the contents of this workshop with Scarlet Spear, but have decoupled the changes so you will have time to experience the revisions. We are targeting a release date early next week on PC. After we've iterated on revisions, you'll jump into the biggest operation in Warframe's history, Scarlet Spear. Here is your guide for navigating what matters to you in this 20-part dev workshop. And if you don't feel like reading, well, Rob is here to read it for you so you don't have to read it yourself. Um, now, as you can see, they do have an index. And like I said, I'm going to be trimming the fat on some of these things because there is a lot to cover. If I'm going to be honest with you, I already started recording this video and realized there was too much to cover. So uh, we're going to speed through a couple things. So first and foremost, we have Railjack onboarding changes. We'll be touching on that. Railjack bug fixes. We're not really going to go into it too deeply because they're bug fixes. Fix your shit. Number three, armor, health, and shield. This is very very interesting, um, and I definitely wanted to discuss that a bit. Infested damage, AI aimbots, shield gating, self damage changes, um, and then we have excavator, health shield scaling changes, um, basura changes, and a Vobon tweak. None of those are really worth mentioning. Um, reward changes, uh, select UI changes from workshop part two. There's really nothing there. Uh, restore 100 times blueprints. Sentinel mods, shared usage allowed. That literally says it in and of itself. Arcane changes, these are massive. Greater than 100% status having meaning, that's also massive. Status mod buffs, grenade markers, Kuvalich murmurs, fixes, and other things that we really don't need to discuss because those things are not important. Um, just keep in mind, I will also leave linked down in the description box below this article. If there was anything that I pointed out that I'm not really going to be talking about that you want to read for yourself, feel free to, but there's a lot to cover. So prologue, the thread of reasoning. When presented with a 20 part workshop that touches everything from specific warframes to damage types, you may find yourself asking why. Each section will receive a tailored explanation to the change, some deeper than others, because let's be real, you don't really need to tell us that scaling excavators and missions is a good idea. Just put it out there. But a thread of reasoning can be found woven throughout this workshop. Warframe always aims to become a better version of itself. Year after year, we, are com we completely change things, from Melee last year to Movement years ago and so on. Enough systems have accrued to make our choice over these past three months a simple one. Review, refresh, and revise. We aim to refresh aspects of the game that have gone untouched while addressing fundamental inconsistencies in the mechanics of the game. Warframe is still about power and you being a destructive force in the origin system with hundreds of tools at your disposal. Warframes have never been more lethal or powerful than they are in the current version of Warframe. We do not aim to reduce that across the board, but we do aim to let that power stand on consistency in our designs. Keep guiding our reasoning in mind while read it, reading the three R's. PC players will get a 2 times affinity weekend following launch. Consoles will get a 2 times affinity weekend following launch. The one thing that I really do want to point out here is maybe tossing in a couple forma 
would be fantastic. Maybe even like a Weapon Exilus um, adapter, something along those lines, because legitimately some of these changes are going to be affecting your weapons dramatically. Some that you may love. Now, the Railjack onboarding changes, I'm going to go over these real quick because it's very simple. DE made creating a Railjack very, very expensive. They're going to be reducing the cost um, by 66 to about 75% on some of these things, and they are going to cut down the time. Instead of 12 hours, I believe it's going to be 6 hours each. Now, if you have never played Railjack, don't worry. All of these are going to be there for you. If you are halfway through creating your Railjack, you will be reimbursed um, the items that you've already spent on. Also, you'll be getting one of the little, um, what is it called? The, uh, the rush build drones. You're going to get one of those. Um, and then after that, you'll transition into the cheaper model. And for the first time in Warframe history, I think that this is fantastic. And I really do feel like this is something that DE needs to focus on a little bit more because as much as you can build goodwill, with some of the changes that you make, you can also build ill will. And D is building a lot of ill will with some of the things like Focus 2.0, Login 2.0, a lot of these things, Eidolons, like a lot of those things where they completely forget that there are players that have already sunk in hundreds, even thousands of hours into these systems. And then they're like, oh, well, we're just going to let the new kids benefit and, you know, Fuck you for spending time in our game. Um, so what they're actually going to do is if you completed the Rising Tide, they're going to refund you all of the resources or the differences with the resources that you spent. So you're getting all of that back. In addition, you're going to get two rush repair drones. So it's not like you've lost anything whatsoever and you gain an extra rush repair drone, which to be honest, isn't really that much. But I mean, it's something, right? Um, and then we also have the Railjack bug fixes. We have over 45 bug fixes coming to Railjack in Scarlet Spear, um, including some of the big ticket fixes, which is great because as early as yesterday, we had some really interesting loading bugs. Not the infinity loading bugs, but the your ship didn't quite make it into the skybox loading bug. So hopefully they get that fixed. Armor health shield changes. This is really, really interesting. And I think will make some players happy and also make some players question the future of Warframe. The section will go over before and after scenarios with our enemy armor, health, and shield changes. Reading this section should give you a conceptual and on paper understanding of what we're changing and why, but practical experiences will tell the full story here. You may need to refresh some aspects of your build to truly optimize your power against your enemies. Before. Armor, shields, and health are on an exponential curve. So basically what happened is you started going up and then you started going up and then you started going way up. So basically all of the EHPs were skyrocketing for armored targets and it just turned them into bullet sponges, which we like difficulty, but bullet spongy difficulty is really not all that fantastic. After, armor, shields, and health on an S curve. So basically what's ha gonna happen is it's gonna go up and it's gonna kind of peak. They did note at around level 75 is when it's gonna stop having such a drastic exponential curve, but instead it's gonna kind of like slope off. It'll still go up, but it will still slowly go up. Now, basically what that means is enemies are going to be easier to kill overall, but does leave some of the Warframe players out there seeking a challenge um, a little bit of a question as to, all right, well, their survivability is going down what's going to make enemies difficult. Hopefully we get some tweaks to AI because we are seeing some interesting things over here where we talk about um, damage changes. Enemy damage output should still be close to what it currently is, live version of the game, but we have made a few changes that will affect how players take damage in the game. So damage type changes. Slash status now does not bypass shields and instead deals damage over time to shields. So keep in mind whenever you have a slash proc, it's not going to go directly bypassing the shields. It's still going to tick away at the shields. However, slash status will still bypass armor. So they've made slash into the armor specific damage type or the armor bypassing specific damage type. Toxin used to apply to armor with a 25% bonus. Now it's neutral. For roll distinction, Toxin bypasses shields but not armor, whereas Slash bypasses armor but not shields. So you got a, a shield bypassing specialist and an armor bypassing specialist. I think that's totally fair. 
player changes. Player shields, health, and armor used to be shared with an all AI. So they all had the weaknesses and resistances that their AI counterparts did. Now players have their own unique shield, health, and armor type classified as Tenno. These have all weaknesses and resistances neutralized for now. Player shields now reduce 25% of incoming damage. Again, this is looking really good for Mag, I'm just saying. We'll be talking about her a little bit more later. Um, player shields now recharge with a custom player-only logic. Shield recharge delays are based on depleted or partial depleted shields. Partially depleted shields, any amount, is a 1 second recharge delay. Full depletion is a 4 second recharge delay. These changes to player shields are in addition to coming shield gating changes, which you'll read about in our shield gating section. And why? Armor scaling and enemy damage reduction was the nucleus for change. For years, Tenno have had the tools to deal with these things, but the tools were uniform, use corrosive projection or else. While this is simplification, it removed the feeling of choice. With these changes, we hope players experience a feeling of variety and choice when taking on enemies. By changing the scaling of armor, we could consistently change the scaling for all. The interesting thing here is this is something that we see that did in Melee 2.999997. Basically, a lot of the weapons out there, we, we had some very, very strong meta weapons, but DE kind of evened the playing field on that and created almost two separate metas, which was kind of like the combo-heavy status meta, you know, the Weeping Wounds meta, and then, of course, the forced slash proc critical meta. So any weapons that were a little bit heavier and had, like, forced slash proc on certain parts of their combo or their heavy hitting parts, they had their own meta. And all of those kind of play very similar on the fields. It looks like they're kind of doing the same thing when it comes to the damage types. Moving along, we have infested damage. We did not want to overlook the infested in our review. Infested are close range enemies that telegraph most attacks. And now if one of those attacks hits you, it simply does more damage. Stay agile, stay on moving, and the mission is as good as one. There's really no need for any further explanation on that. They just, they needed something. <laughs> AI aimbot. Until now in Warframe, the higher the enemy level, the better their accuracy. High level enemies would be pinned at the best accuracy. They are capable of not quite 100%, but getting pretty close. Things like your movement and mods would reduce accuracy, but the potential for bad aimbot movements was too high. We have spread this progression across at a greater range of AI. Now we're decoupling enemy accuracy from level to reduce the overall aimbot-like behaviors you face at high level. Um, why? This change allows us to more uh, accurate balancing of foes at higher level. This change alone would be noticed simply sometimes by getting hit less, but in conjunction with the numerous other changes we're making to enemies, it's part of a holistic refresh to the underlying mechanics behind Warframe's enemies. Like I was saying earlier, hopefully we also see an improvement to AI and increased difficulty in some other way, shape, or form. Aimbot isn't necessarily fun and squishy, or not squishy, um, but bullet spongy enemies are also not fun. So this really kind of leaves DE in a pickle to figure out how they're going to introduce difficulty in some way, shape, or form because legitimately this just turns into Dynasty Warriors. Not saying that Dynasty Warriors isn't great, but Warframe feels like you're just taking on a bunch of weak enemies, blowing them up. And while some people love that power fantasy, I know that I've been loving Monster Hunter a lot lately because there is one motherfucking tough enemy that can wipe out your health in two swipes, so you need to get good or go home. And right now Warframe is not offering that and right now what it seems like Warframe is doing is they're kind of taming some of those things down and hopefully it makes way for those stronger enemies to shine. So we'll have some just a couple really strong enemies that we need to take down while the rest of them do feel kind of like Dynasty Warrior-esque minions. Just putting that out there. Um, next up we have Shield Gating Friend and Foe. This is Really juicy, makes me excited to play Hildren and Mag again because I'm like, ooh, this is gonna be fun. Friend, first let's answer what is shield gating. When it applies to you as a player, this in this implementation, shield gating is the mechanic of preventing an instance of lethal one-shot damage if you have shields active. Simply put, the goal is to reduce the number of one-shots you take when your shields are up, particularly for shield-based frames. When any shields are active, an incoming hit that depletes your last bit of shields will not continue into your health pool. So let's say you have 100 shields left and an enemy hits you for 1000 points of damage. 
you're only going to get your shields depleted by 100 and none of it will bleed into your health. So definitely keep that in mind. Um, and uh, let's see. An incoming depletes your shields will not continue your health pool and also triggers uh, a brief time where your health is protected. So you get a little bit of an invulnerability period. Very similarly to Hildren's passive where she gets an invulnerable period period. I'm assuming that hers is going to be a little bit longer than, you know, the standard players. Hopefully they'll, you know, do something to judge that up a bit. Um, but that is really, really nice because it allows players to kind of react saying, oh shit, I'm down to just bare health. Um, additionally, you will no longer take slash status effect damage to your health while shields are up. And that is very, very nice because there are certain enemies out there that do very similarly to us where we bypass shields and it doesn't feel nice when we do it to the, when they do it to us. So, I mean, I guess it's just fair. Now, when it comes to foe, enemies, Corpus in particular, also have received a bit of shield gating, but with skillful gameplay can overcome this. Any headshots or shots to weak spots completely bypass Corpus enemy shield gating. In addition, 5% of the damage dealt while hitting the shield gate will target enemy health. So again, we were talking about that 1,000 points of health, and let's say a corpus enemy only has 100 health left. You're going to be able to do that full 100 points of their shield, and then 5% of the remaining damage from that 1,000, so like 5% of 900, I can't do math, but 5% of that will hit their health. Um, unless, of course, you hit them for a headshot, which means that completely will bypass um, any shield gating that occurs or any other weak spots. Um, this allows you to take your form of fueled weapons back to low level enemies and hit them hard instead of hitting the shield gates. The goal here is to make shields a mechanic you want to play against with mods or as elemental or to bypass with skill headshots. Slash status effects now deal damage over time to shields. Toxin damage remains as is, bypassing shields to directly affect enemy health. Damage from Warframe abilities will ignore the shield gate. So again, damage from Warframe abilities will ignore the enemy shield gate. I.e. if an instance of damage from an ability is greater than the shield value, it will go into health as well. Um, why? Giving both friend and foe shield gating has two purposes. We want to reward skill a bit more in all corpus missions and give these squishier frames a bit more viable edge and a chance to really explore shield focused builds. Like I said earlier, very, very excited um, for specifically Mag. Now, listen, with Hildren, you don't have to worry so much because with her skill set and the right modding, you can basically be invincible with her. But Mag has always struggled a bit, and I love me some Mag play. Like, she can deal an insane amount of damage, but she did have some issues with survivability that, you know, you always kind of had to do your best, be on your top tier to outplay it. But now, because of the fact that, number one, you have that shield recharge that's only one second if you've even got a little bit of shields up, and shield gating to prevent um, damage from leaking through, because of the fact that she can restore her shields like that, it's going to be quite nice. I'm excited. Um, let's see. Let's see if there was anything else. Uh... The toxin damage and status effects are still your friend against corpus or shielded enemies. Now, this next bit are arcane changes. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of this, but I do feel like it deserves its own video. Because as you can see right here, they have a list. A long, long list of arcanes that I do want to go through and read for you guys so you don't have to read them yourself. And I also want to point out a couple other things in that video. But let's take a look at what they're saying. After years of arcanes as a system, with several additions to the offerings and replacement locations, we are doing several things. Increasing the maximum rank of Warframe and Operator arcanes to 5, up from 3. Arcane revives are a bonus that begins on rank 3. Adjusting the power of arcanes at rank 5 to generally behave as if you had 1.5 equipped. List as follows. So, we've got the list there, which again we'll go over in a separate video. Removing the ability to equip two of the same arcane simultaneously, um, which definitely can hurt some builds out there because I know there's some people who love their arcane double stack graces. Those were always nice. I run arcane energized doubled up too, but this seems to be like a fairly decent change that they're doing here. Um, let's see. Added the ability to distill assembled arcanes back into multiple unranked ones, which is very nice. Operator Magus Arcanes will be overviewed in the official patch notes, but will also receive five ranks. Thank God, because they needed it. And last but not least, 
adding arcanes as rewards for Operation Scarlet Spear. Now this is going to be major because they did mention on the dev stream that what they're going to do with this is you're actually going to be able to choose the arcanes that you want. So if there's anything that you've been eyeing, maybe you need to round out um, a stack of them. You're like, I just need two more. This is going to be something that'll allow you to slowly work towards it. Now, why? The reasoning here is mainly towards the ability to equip two of the same arcane. This reasoning is one of the past inconsistency and time determining intent. There are a lot of builds that specialize in the use of two arcanes, but we want to encourage a variety instead of duplication. Again, like I said, very, very similarly to what they did with Melee 2.99997, because they're not done with Melee. Remember that. Arcanes are the only upgrade system in the game that allowed two um, of the exact same upgrade to be equipped, and we would rather players have variety than duplications. In the same way you can't equip Amalgam Serration and Regular Serration, you can't equip multiple Rivens per weapon or any duplication of mods at all. Arcanes will now follow, but we are making major changes to the ranking up from 3 to 5 with power changes. Instead of having two of the same arcane with a double effect, you can now choose between two different arcanes that behave generally at 1.5 times efficacy than before. One of the things that I really wanted to point out before we moved on from Arcanes, and I feel very strongly about this, I loved it because uh, DE Steve was reading the chat, and one of the points that was made in chat was very important, okay? The issue here is, yes, we have certain Arcanes that risen as the cream of the crop of Arcanes for people to use, but somebody said... It's not their fault that they're at the top, it's the fact that you keep making useless arcanes. And I think that is a very strong point that they made. I did take a look at some of the arcanes that they've kind of uh, tweaked a little bit to be better, and I do see some potential in them. However, you have to keep in mind, if you're gonna introduce something into this system that is meant to be a top-end system, you have to make sure that it's top-end. See, in Warframes and in weapons, we've introduced things like Exila slots. And let's be real, what the Exila slot basically is, is it's a weird fucking mod that we would, that people would never normally put into their Warframe unless it's a for fun. And in general, players want effectiveness over for fun. So I'm gonna put it out here, you know, all of those for fun arcanes better make them useful. Because if you're not making them useful, and I don't want to hear this, there's a difference between useful and usable. Because yeah, you can use something, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's useful, okay? Just saying. Um, so I hope that that is something that they really take a look at. And like I said, we'll dedicate a separate video into that and figure out whether the changes that they're making are enough to make it better. Now, this one is really, really interesting because I mentioned this in a previous video. I'm going to shout out my brother, Rob Headshot, because, you know, I'm Rob, he's Rob, we're both Robs in it together. And there was alliteration at the very beginning of this video with all of those R's. It's an R season um, for pointing out, why the fuck do we need self-damage? In this day and age? In this day and age? In this economy? Are you kidding me? Self-damage changes. We are getting rid of self-damage and replacing it with something else. Instead of stealth damage, it's now stagger. This change completely removes the chance of killing yourself and instead now creates scenarios where you will interrupt or stagger to varying degrees if you aren't careful. The degrees of self-interrupt start with a small stumble all the way to a full knockdown depending on how close you are to the center of explosion. Any mods referring to self-damage will be converted to acknowledge Stagger. With this self-interrupt system, we have added dozens of new recovery animations that harness a ninja-like recovery experience. Here's a dev build video of this in action. And this was kind of cool. Let me turn that audio off. Um, and I really liked some of the animations that accompany this because I was like, ooh, that's fancy. Uh, but I think DE Rebecca might have had it to do an auto recover. So as you can see right there, um, you get this kind of like flip where you accidentally hit yourself. Now go ahead and toss up on screen um, some of the clips from the dev stream that actually showed this recovery. Now I'm under the impression that this is an automatic recovery because Rebecca did say, is it on auto right now? It made it sound like it's something that you're gonna have to do your own reaction to. They also specifically said that there were going to be instances where you could like double jump or backflip from those. Um, 
In addition to this change, some of the more powerful AoE weapons without self-damage presently will have the stagger added, but it should only be noticeable in cases of extreme inaccuracy on the player's part. As a result of this overall systematic change, weapons with status will be get or stagger will be getting approximately a 20% buff in damage, with any weapons with AoE receiving a 50% radial damage falloff from central impact. So basically keep in mind, you still want to be accurate with your weapon to make sure that the enemy is kind of sort of in that center area because it's no longer going to be flat damage in the area. You want to make sure to get it as close as possible to deal the most damage and then anything on the outskirts is going to drop off down to 50%. Kind of like damage fall off um, from short range weapons. And their why for it is self damage had a lot of drawbacks for weapons resulting in flow disrupting death. The stagger replacement system favors agility with a less harsh consequence while allowing some of the most powerful weapons in game to remain that way due to their unique consequence. Weapons with self damage will be converted into this new system and as a result self damage is removed from Warframe. I, I asked the question and they answered the question, no, uh, self damage doesn't need to be there. I think it's a big, uh, big improvement on what they've done, it also introduces the whole ninja aspect of movement to it and I think that that was one of the biggest things uh, that came when it was with Warframe, it was just kind of like, you know, an ally could step in front of you at any point in time and they could kind of control whether you lived or died. It was some of their actions that fucked it up. And Warframe is a fast paced game and staggers can definitely fuck you up, maybe not as fucked up as a death. But in my head, I'm just kind of saying like, this is definitely a better change for Warframe. Like, they just, we don't want to die from our own stupidity, specifically me. We want to die from good, powerful enemies, right? Um, excavator scaling changes. I don't really need to say anything about this. The higher you go up in your missions, you're going to have excavators with scaling health. The end. Um, Basura changes in Vauban Tweak. There is nothing here that speaks on getting rid of um, Forced Vacuum. But what I'm going to say this is Basura is a powerhouse. She's unplayable currently in capable hands. She's... Uh, uh, unplayable in capable hands. The above revisit may encourage more people to pick her up and master her for the upcoming war. Here's the thing that I will stress over and over. The only thing that's going to make me pick up Titania or cover this trash queen in any way, shape, or form is the removal of Forth's vacuum. Don't have to say it. If you want her picked up, if you want, you know, listen, I was a hardcore stan. I'm more than happy to show off fashion. I'm more than happy to show off builds. I'm more than happy to pump her up. But right now, she's a deflated trash bag. So please, remove Force Vacuum. Um, moving along, we have Vauban Armor. Vauban's base armor is changing from 50 to 150, and Vauban Prime is changing from 100 to 200. Why? A minor bump in survivability if your CC strategies fail you. There you go. That's, that's the best Warframe tweak in the bunch. Um, moving on, we have Reward Cleanup Base Missions. Base missions are getting a small cleanup in this main line. For references, all tables are currently available at warframe.com backslash drop tables. This change will be told from the perspective of a single node, for example, purposes, but the logic applies game-wide to base missions, which is to say the nodes on the star chart, including special missions like the Index, Open Worlds, Rathum, Assassination. Consider the node Memphis Phobos. Base missions like Memphis are receiving a bit of fat trimming in terms of the lowest point rewards available within them. For example, Memphis on Phobos will have its 500, 1,000, and 1,500 credit caches removed, as well as the 15 um, and 50 endo. This will leave only the 2,000 credit caches and the 80 endo drop in each category with a drop chance of the sum of all prior don't. Uh, denominations. So basically what they're saying is all the different variants are going to be removed and they're just going to keep the highest variant. So you're not going to have, oh, you have a chance to get 2,000 credits or 1,000 credits or 1,500 credits. No. If you get credits, it's just going to be 2,000 credits. Um, and when it comes to endo, instead of getting 80, getting 15, getting 50, no, you're just going to get the 80. There's no no lower no lower base bits. And I wonder, I wonder how this affects their database. Because now they don't got to keep track of all of the trashy endo bits. So this is really, really nice. Nice kind of cuts, cuts down on all of those extra ones. Um, there's some UI quality of life changes that we really don't need to touch on too much because it's just UI quality of life. 
Um, this one is really, really cool. The 100 times restore blueprints uh, and scaling costs. Very simply put, um, in your dojo, is it in your dojo? Let me make sure. Yes, it is in your dojo. You're gonna have a new research option where you can research the 1000 times restore blueprints. So, you know, energy, shields, health, all of that, you'll be able to craft up 100 at a time. Um, and they did say, prepare your Railjack resources because that's what's gonna be used to research. I'm assuming it's to research the um the costs for the blueprints so you'll be able to do 10 100 instead of 10 at a piece which is very very nice why the frequency at which players use these in missions versus the one minute wait times for building one uh 10 times meant that we could level up the batches here railjack resources are being used for research okay research um to give another use for what you're picking up that is very very nice uh sharing sentinel mods basically if you have a serration on your primary weapon and your sentinel is using serration on this, you don't need two separate serrations. Congratulations. That's all that needs to be said here. All of this text is too much. Basically, your sentinels now share your mods. No need to be like, oh shit, I gotta find another lower version of Hel Hell's Chamber because my shotgun on this one isn't needed. It's a nice change. They should have been doing it. Now, moving along, this is where things get juicy. We have the greater than 100% status having meaning. Years ago, we added orange and red critical damage numbers when you land a critical chance greater than 100%. For years, status being greater than 100% has done nothing except guarantee status, which is good, just not an added incentive to go over 100%. We're changing that this update. When you hit a status chance greater than 100%, a single damage instance will be available to create stew status effects. So think about this for your condition overload builds. I'm just putting it out there. This means if you have a shot with 200% status chance modded with both blasts and toxin damage, that single shot will result in both status effects. They also stated, well, I guess I'll put it here. In addition to being able to achieve two status effects on a single shot, we are also adding new meaning if you get the duplicate status on an enemy. So just because you have both blast and toxin damage on your weapon, it doesn't mean you're going to get one of each. You could get a double toxin, you could get a double blast. So that's what they're talking about here. Um, for example, AoE knockdown would occur on a second impact status on an enemy already inflicted with one. Stay tuned for the full breakdown on each status's enhanced effect in the patch notes. It's worth noting that we are fixing a UI inconsistency that is display only. Right now, the arsenal shows status chance affected by multi-shot, which makes reading the new 100% status value very confusing. For example, the arsenal might say 120%, but really the status chance is 80%. We don't have multi-shot affect any critical stats, chance, or critical multiplier, so we are fixing this display inconsistency. Multi-shot now has its own stats. So again, remember when you put a multi-shot mod on and all of a sudden the status would go up? It's not going to go up anymore. It's just, it's just visual. It's not actually affecting the weapon. It's just impacting the visuality of it. Next up, which I think a lot of people are very curious about, shotguns have a unique role here based on patchwork history with how they interact with status chance. A shotgun that shoots 99% status chance would give you 35% roughly status per pellet. 100% status chance gives you 100% status per pellet. So you see how that works? It's a big, it's a big drop off. This huge jump in performance happens with just a 1% gain. Why? Well, to answer that, we have to look at our choice to make the UI conveys reality. It would feel broken to shoot a shotgun with 100% status and not see a perfect spread of effects. In reality, to make status consistent, we have to treat shotguns as a special case. Shotguns as a special case means that we have buffed the status chance of all shotguns by three times or greater. The UI now behaves to show the reality that you are determining status chance per pellet. They actually went ahead and showed this on the dev stream and basically it's just like another stat. Where it actually shows you a per pellet, it's nice because it shows you a per pellet breakdown of the damage, the elemental, and the status. So that's kind of cool. In further additions, previously unstackable status effect, puncture, cold, magnetic, radiation, viral, will now have stacking effects. We'll have more information on this later as it develops. Why? Critical has long been king, and while we are leaving critical as is, our goal is to bring status into the arsenals as in a new light 
for all primary, secondary, and melee weapons. Um, so, a lot of discussion is going to be happening about this, and maybe a discussion video needs to happen when it comes to shotguns, but basically what they showed on the stream is just how dramatic um, 1% made with the efficacy of shotguns. This means that there's going to have to be some shotgun tweaking, and like I said, maybe some people might want some Forma refunds, DE, just putting that out there. Maybe slip a couple Formas into that Double Affinity Weekend. Um, but in reality, this means it's going to be a big meta change for a lot of shotguns out there, and I'm really, really curious to see how this all comes into play. They did say that it feels like overall shotguns are better with the new factoring in the new status effect changes. Um, I'm going to wait till it goes live to really give you guys my 100% feelings about this because the status chance change, the status changes could be pretty major with the way that they affect shotguns. So we'll get the status, uh, uh the status effect change, um, also affecting the shotguns and we'll see how that kind of plays into their efficacy because who knows? They might be really, really powerful, but in a very different way. You know what I'm saying? So, um, let's move on to Status Chance mod buffs. The so Status Chance mods were released many years ago and have not been considered worthwhile. There are simply better options within the Status Mods builds. Dual stacks or critical builds are more appealing. We are buffing all standalone Status Chance mods to increase the appeal of building status for your weapons. So basically, all of the 15% status chances have been increased up to 90% status chance. And then Shotgun Savvy increased from 30% status chance to 90% status chance. Just keep in mind that this does not touch any of the elemental status mods. Those are still sitting at 60. This is just the base ones like Rifle, ap Aptitude, Melee Prowess, Sure Shot, so on and so forth. Why this is a long overdue change that will thrive when paired with the above change of giving 100% status, meaning the goal is to give your arsenals a shakeup in terms of what status may mean for some of your collection. This is a power output increase across the board for status, if we're using those. Um, grenade markers. This is very, very simple. Basically, enemies that throw grenades will have a grenade marker and you should be able to shoot them and then you don't have to worry about it. It's a visible HUD marker and it will give you a little bit of a glow so that you can see when they're about to explode. I believe it flashes a little bit faster when it's about to explode. Um, the only thing that happened is I think D.E. Pablo shared a screen of a sticky grenade sticking directly on his Warframe and him not being able to shoot it off. Uh, it's great, especially if you have some, you know, grenades maybe going in on defense targets. Sometimes you have them on, like, the moving uh, defense targets, the allied defense targets. So it's nice to be able to knock those out if you're trying to do a really good job at defense, especially if you're getting uh, into high levels and some of those targets may be dealing a lot of damage. So you can kind of counteract that. Um, Kuvalich Murmurs slash Fixes. So Requiem Murmurs from failing a Kuvalich Parazon stab will now again be shared with the entire squad. That's really all they said about that, and that's all that you really need to know on here. Um, but they do have a chunk of general Kuvalich changes and fixes coming in this main line. Um, I'm looking through this right now, and I'm not necessarily seeing anything that is worth mentioning here. Um, just some fixes and then some previews of uh, some upcoming, you know, video changes to make things look prettier. The one thing that I will note here, and I kind of really, really like this, this is one of the visual notes that I wanted to change, is they are going to be uh, increasing FOV. So it's going from 78 up to um, 90. And a lot of people have asked me before exactly like, why my video looks really, really good sometimes, or why, you know, the game looks better. I have a whole display video, which I'll leave linked down in the description as well. I get asked this all the time, and I've literally covered it in, like, five videos already. And I'm like, I'm not going to make a fifth video. Here's the link. But one of the things that I don't think I ever mentioned is I do have my FOV turned all the way up. So that might be a thing. Um, there's a last little bit down here 
that uh, I did want to cover as well. But let's let's cover closing 20 parts later. You've made it to the end and it bears repeating. Warframe always aims to become a better version of itself. You may realize something after reading. Warframe's meta might change, but if you've been playing for a while, you realize something else. Warframe is always changing, except for that shitty forced vacuum. That hasn't changed. You know, that could go away. That could maybe, you know, be made an option instead of being forced on us, okay? Um, Warframe is still about power and you being a destructive force in the origin system with hundreds of tools at your disposal. So we don't really need to go over there. It's just basically them telling us about uh, how great we are and how great they are. Let's leave this off with bonus section, Scarlet Spear. If you're holding out for new content, two major updates are coming. Operation Scarlet Spear will soon... Um, with a major event and lore than the Deadlock Protocol in after with a Deep Corpus remaster and a release of Protea. So as you can see, they've actually attached dates to it. Early March for Scarlet Spear and then April for the Deadlock Protocol. Um, with that, that closes out um, this Rob Reads You Shit That You Don't Want to Read Yourself slash hashtag confirmed. Um, again, there's a lot of things to talk about when it comes down to Arcanes, which I want to discuss in a separate video. And if there's anything else that you want to hear from me down in the comments below, let me know and we'll cover that as well. Regardless, that about does it for me for now. So as always, love somebody, hurt nobody, and touch your body. I'll see you guys next time. Bye bye